hello, hello. Welcome back to the end of the course. These are the last few talks that I'm going to give on this course. But, um, you know, this is probably going to be uh, up for a while, so you can always return to it, you know? And Discord, you know, Discord will be around. I know I'm always talking about Discord, and you're probably sick of it, but Discord will always be here. It will always be here for you, and it will always have places to talk about the university, rhetoric, general conversation, post your favorite memes. It's all there for you, student-centered Discord. For more, check the syllabus, or you can reach out to me, and I will um, I'll send you an invite if you still haven't figured it out. Well, welcome. This is the end of the semester. Can you believe it? We don't have much time left. You might be watching this um, around Thanksgiving time, maybe. I don't know. Last book. Last book and the last chats about the last book are here. And uh, that last book is Snow Leopard. Which I, I've never taught in a um, public speaking class before. Never taught this book before. I have read it many, many, many times. I'm very familiar with it. And in reading it this time, I felt that maybe there were some things that we should talk about beforehand that struck me different. You know, the, one, the one thing about reading a text and studying a text is that the text stays stable. Texts are always stable. Snow Leopard will be the same as it was when it was first printed. And I think 1978, 77, first edition. I don't remember. Snow Leopard always stay the same. But what won't stay the same is our attitude uh, towards it or towards the writing or towards uh, the perspective of it. So my read of Snow Leopard is going to be very different than maybe someone else's. This book is celebrated as a travel, as travel writing, as amazing travel writing, uh, amazing description, and amazing um, what they call a travel log, which is a, a, a genre of writing about taking a journey. And... Uh, I think it's so cool. All the things that happen here are very cool. Particularly the attention that uh, Mathiasen pays to birds and other small animals. I just think it's really nice. But um, trying to sustain attention on a journey, I think, is an interesting thing to study. So I thought it would be good for public speaking. The other thing I think is good for public speaking is it shows you kind of a narrative style and how to maybe mimic some of that when you're telling a story or when you're putting people in a situation. Far too often, people who are new at speech will merely talk about the meta. They'll say, well, I'm going to tell you a story now about blah, 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 and it's just far too meta, and um, it takes you out of it. I'm, I'm listening to you tell a story. I'm not in the story. I'm not participating in the story. I'm not doing anything like that. So Mathiasen's very, very good, I think, taking us out of the meta and making us feel like we're there. He's, we're walking with him. We're, we're having the feels and the experiences. Is that, do kids still say that? The feels? Is that still something that people say? I don't really know. Coffee. I think, um, maybe you do, but you can let me know in the comments. Some people still say the feels. That hit me in the feels. People used to say that a couple of years ago. This book has a lot of feels to it, but um, the problem I had this time with it, well, no, let's not go there just yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's a, that, those are the two reasons so far. Travelogue, which is a cool topic. Immediate, kind of demediated, because it's not really immediate, because when, when I write something rhetorically that is immediate, like here it is without filter, you all have learned from studying David Bohm that Everything is mediated, including human thought. In fact, the mediation of human thought makes it extremely difficult to understand that when we're thinking, we're doing, and we do not have any way of remediating that. So my thought is demediation is a rhetorical strategy of showing the audience that um, here's what I'm experiencing and thinking about, and you can think about too, when you're aware that Matthiasen is telling you this stuff and that he's walking you through it and that he's giving you his perspective and all of that, but you still kind of feel like these things are coming around the corner or these birds pop into the, or the animals pop into the frame 
or the ice and the snow is very slippery and it's just very acute. And I like that. And I wonder if maybe it's possible to learn from that style for putting our speeches together. Uh, the final thing is that I think it's good to riff off of because there might be things he says in here that become good speech topics and things you want to think about. Uh, I gave you some prompts in the syllabus. Again, you're not, you don't have to follow those prompts. Those were written in the summer when I didn't know any of you. And I wasn't sure um, how good you'd be at this, but you've shown that you're quite good at this at this point. So I feel like you can just kind of riff and do your own thing. But what to riff off of? Well, Matthiasen, his history, some of the things he says in this book might be worth talking about, particularly if you're familiar with some of the parts of the world that this book takes place in, India, Tibet, Nepal, places like that. A lot of you might have some familiarity with that, and um, it would be kind of cool to uh, to hear some of that, riff off of that. Or maybe there's something he said that made you think of an experience in your life or something you want to talk about, or you want to push back on what he's saying. Uh, texts are a wonderful way to talk to the audience about larger questions, larger issues, larger questions, things li of that nature, which I think are um, really great to, to discuss and to uh, find a common way in with the audience, and that's what this book, I think, can do. Now, this time reading it, I ran into some issues with it. Um, the way he describes people is very outdated and outmoded. The people are of a certain stock. They're a certain race. You know, the Aryans, the Tibetan stock, the the um, all these weird phrases. We'll see as we get into it, uh, and that might be offensive to you. And that's perfectly fine. You're of this era where we don't really speak that way anymore about race and about people's identity and things like that. This book was written in 19... These events happened in 1972, 73, and it was written at that time. And this was considered at the time to be an appropriate way to talk about these things. So we have a couple of options. We could dismiss the book entirely because of this, the way he talks about race and just not read it and cancel it. Or we could say... Um, that, you know, if he were aware or if he was writing this today, he would make accommodations and probably think differently about it. Or we can read it as part of the way to understand the book and part of the way to understand the perspective and really get something cool. Because I was reading it like that, and I was I was also kind of shocked about kind of the the harsh way he discussed race. And I'm like, oh, man, the students are going to want to cancel this book. This is not good. Because I think, I'm, I don't know what your politics are. I assume university students are pretty left-leaning. And cancel culture is pretty popular. Um, everybody kind of likes that because it's simple-minded. People like cancel culture because it's easy. It's a binary decision. It's a lot more difficult to say, well, what can I salvage and what is ethically salvageable about this position or about what this person is saying given the offenses that they've committed or given the errors that they've made. Think about it in terms of mistakes. You can say, well, they made a lot of big mistakes. Now, do those mistakes mean we cannot look at anything else they're saying in the work with any value? And sometimes the answer is yes. Absolutely, we could say that. But it's not the immediate or automatic answer that a lot of people would have you believe that when you find um, offensive kinds of descriptions or descriptions that turn you off that that would be the immediate binary. A lot of people are like this, though. They're like, oh, yep, that's it, canceled. This is like baby bathwater kind of syndrome in my mind. I just wonder if there is a way, or is there a value to practicing saying, what is ethical for me to recover from this? Or what can I do with it that would make it um, useful or interesting to me in the way I want to speak about these things? These are kind of important, I would say. The book is um, kind of a silly premise, it's not really about snow leopards, but um, the idea that one could be one of the few people at this time to see a snow leopard really is attractive to the narrator. And we'll see as we get into the book why it's so attractive to the narrator. Why is the narrator so attracted to this as we go through it? Uh, the narrator is not really being 100% with us until we get to the end. And that's the way I'm reading it too, is like, here is a man who is um, going through something. He, he doesn't really tell us what it is at first. Going through something, and it's this 
trip and the ability to kind of be with his friend GS, the uh, zoologist, the biologist who is um, studying the blue sheep, invites him on this journey to Tibet, to some of the foreign areas of um, Tibet and Nepal, very high altitude kind of mountains, snowy mountains, to go and look at these rare sheep and help him study. He's like, you can come along. Love to have you there. And uh, the narrator's like, cool, I'll write about it. But as he's moving through it, we start to learn more about his family and more about his situation. And I think that's kind of interesting when we compare it to kind of these overwrought descriptions of like the anthropological roots of where these people came from, which he's excited to categorize and sort everyone in this very, very Western way. So the, the book is about revelation. Uh, it, it, you know, and at first it's about this idea of, am I going to be one of the few Westerners to see a snow leopard? Am I going to be that special person? And then as it goes on, it's more of like revelations to him about his situation. And to be honest, and maybe a bit of a spoiler, what he's running from. He's running from, I think one of the ways to think about this book is he's running from a disordered world. A world that doesn't make a lot of sense. A world where um, horrible things happen. And he, he's kind of like a primitivist. He wants to get back to these simple, primitive people who know so much. And this is what we would call primitivism. It's this kind of old idea. I, I guess people in the 20s and 30s, maybe even before, where it's this idea that um, you know people who live simple lives or races, groups of people, ethnicities maybe we might say today. I don't even know if that's appropriate for what these groups are, but people who live simple, close to the earth, live in villages, don't have a lot, have some kind of truer or better understanding of the world, the world's truths than we ever will because we're so disconnected from it. And this is like a, a line of thought that's not exactly true, I wouldn't say, but a lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe simple is better and we could learn a lot from native peoples, first peoples who live in simplicity. And you see that through the first third of the book where he's like, ah, oh, these people, you know, they're, ah, I wish the best for them. They're so simple and, and there's something I can learn from their faces, from their round and ruddy faces that tell us what race they are and where they're from and their origin. It's so weird. But I think this is a guy who's trying to impose a Western order on a universe that's very resisting of that. And that's that's kind of the way I've been reading it. And that's like that third option I was talking about, which is, yeah, we can dismiss it and say, wow, you know, what a what a dumb way to look at the world. But I think maybe it is a dumb way of look, looking at the world is one of the conclusions we make from the book. That um, this kind of gregarious white Westerner man trying to sort everything and saying, oh, these birds are from this area and these this the, the geology and the geography and the history, da, 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 all of that, which is super, super strange to me. So... Let's get into some of it, and maybe we can talk a little bit about it in this. Um, this is kind of the first look at Snow Leopard. And like I said, you know, I've never, I haven't really taught this before, and uh, I'm very curious what you think of it. And I'm curious what kind of speeches that we might um, have about this book. So the prologue kind of sets up what's going on. In the first part, Westward, We get all these quotes, and it's dated. It's like a real travelogue. So it's almost like we get the, the pretense that we're reading his diary. And in reading a diary, we get that sense, very much like in Plato, that we're reading a transcript of an event that happened. It's just simply not the case. This is a rhetorical device to make you feel like you're reading the direct, e unmediated, immediate, you know, unmediated and immediate have a lot of relationship there. Unmediated, immediate words of somebody who's on the trail, uh, who's involved in this. I have no doubt that he's reconstructing this from his diary, but he's also working a story here. So to say that it's not rhetorical is to mistake, mistakenly, to deliberately misread the text. I'd say if you say, no, it's not rhetorical, it's a travelogue. This is his journal. Well, he's looking at it months later and years later, and he's looking at it with editors, and they're trying to think about what works to get the feeling he wants to get. So he went through drafts of this, no question. And some drafts were rejected, some were accepted, and we got the final version here. We can't go and look at those notes unless we went to Matthias's archive. But even then, I don't know what we would, what we would get. So 
So here we are. This starts us right in the middle of, right at the beginning, we're right smack in the middle of they're about to set out. Now, it is um, very important, I would say, to realize that this is not the narrator's trip. He's with his friend G.S., and G.S. is the one who set up this expedition. G.S. is a scientist. He has a very scientific view of things, as we'll see when G.S. becomes more prominent in the story, and he's got a scientific epistemology. Now, what I mean by that is that he sees the world in terms of science. Kenneth Burke would say he has occupational psychosis, like all of us do, which is we tend to want to see the world in the terms of our deeply held profession, our um, avocation. What is it that we're going to do that we love instead of our vocation, which is what we do for work? That was something that, like, when I was younger in college and stuff, people would be like, what is your avocation? What is your vocation? I'm like, I don't know. I just like reading books, dude. So I became a professor. So it's important to keep in mind that the narrator is not in charge here and didn't set this up and really is just trying to make sense of what is happening and communicating to us. And communicating this um, kind of uncertainly. So the immediate thing that they try, that the narrator tries to do here as we look is to try to figure out who all the people are in the group. Two white sahibs, four sh Sherpas, 14 porters. The Sherpas are the famous mountain tribe of the northeast Nepal near Namache Bazaar, whose men accompany the ascents of the great peaks. They are Buddhist herders who have come down in recent centuries out of eastern Tibet. Sherpa is a Tibetan word for Easterner, and their language, culture, and appearance all reflect Tibetan origin. And here's where we get into some of the um, problematic language that you might cringe at a little bit. But I do think it's important to read through it just so you can kind of get some of the point of, of what's happening in the book. The rest are of mixed Aryan and Mongol stock. See, this is the, the thing where it's like, mm, I don't know if that's a good way to talk about people, but he, what he's doing is organizing things in a very highly Western way. He's like, we know the origins of these people. Anthropology and science... Show us the origins of these people. And it talks about everything we're having, have, and the porters are mostly, mostly local men of uncertain occupation and steadfast habit, notorious for giving trouble. But it is also true that their toil is hard and wretchedly rewarded about a dollar a day. As a rule, they accompany an expedition for no more than a week away from home, after which they are replaced by others and the hefting and denunciation start anew. Today, nearly two hours pass and clouds have gathered before all 14 are mollified. The tattered line sets off to the west. We are glad to go. So he's happy to get on the road. We're ready to go. So they helped everybody get happy with uh, what they were carrying and who's coming and everything they have to carry. Everybody's happy. The edges of Pokhara might be tropical outskirts anywhere. And your book might be like mine. You might have a little map. Let me show you. Yes, 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 a little map. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, yours might have a little map like mine. And um, I think it's kind of cool. It shows the area of where they are right here on the edge of Tibet in uh, Nepal. And here's the route that they go. And they start off going westward. So you can look at this. It might help you understand where it is that they're going. And we're right over here at the very beginning of it at Pokhara, which, as you can see, is not really on much of the map. So this is the starting place, and they're going to start westward, and then they're going to go north and then back down and around. And so this is very handy to have. Hopefully your edition has it. If not, you can probably look up on the Internet and find a pretty decent um, map PDF that someone scanned and put up there. But I would think your book will have it. Most of the, most editions have it. So I would think yours would have it. So as they leave Pokhara, he's saying we are glad to go, but I wonder if we are glad to go. Sometimes people live there. 
It might be the tropical outskirts anywhere. So it's not special to him. He's like, this is just the outskirts of a tropical village. Vacant children, listless adults, bent dogs, and thin chickens, and a litter of sagging shacks and rubble, mud, weeds, stagnant ditches, bad sweet smells, vivid, bright, broken plastic bits, and dirty fruit peelings awaiting the carrion pig. For want of better fare, both pigs and dogs consume the human excrement that lies everywhere along the paths. Yikes, man. He does not like that town. But look at that description. It just goes from one thing to another. It's a powerful way to describe it. It makes you think, geez, man, what a nasty place. But also, this is lo loaded with judgment here. In fair weather, all this flux is tolerable, but now at the dreg end of the rainy season, the mire of life seems le leached into the sallow skins of these thin beings who squat and soap themselves and wring their clothes each morning in the rain puddles. It's almost like he's like, oh, I'll be glad to get rid of these people. I don't want to see this. It's almost like he expects he's going to go on some exotic vacation. Like, this isn't what he expected to see. Brown eyes observe us as we pass. Confronted with the pain of Asia, one cannot look and one cannot turn away. This is like such like white dude judgment, isn't it? Ah, I cannot look. I cannot turn away. Oh, oh, it's so painful. The need of Asia. It's like, dude, come on. In India, human misery seems so pervasive that one takes it only in stray details. A warped leg or a dead eye, a stick, sick pride dog eating withered grass, an ancient women, woman lifting her sari to move her shrunken bowels by the road. It's like a depressing kind of sad picture. And he's choosing to communicate these things to us. He's like, at least there's opal life like Calcutta they've kind of given up. Shiva dances in the spicy foods and exhilarated bells of the swarming bicycles, the angry bus horns. He's talking about the major cities there. It's just kind of sad, you know. Um, it's a very sad description. But this is a guy who expect, and you can tell he's like, this isn't really what I want to see. I mean, I'm seeing it, I'm taking it in, but I don't want to see this. This is like depressing and sad. Then this is the part that I think is really telling. There's an old man sitting there. He's been ravened from within. Wow. That blind and greedy stare of his. So he's like a sick old man, but he still has a greedy and blind stare. How can he be blind and have a greedy stare? Like, come on. This is like really reaching here. That caved-in look and the mouth working reveal who now inhabits him, who now stares out. Death. I nod to death in passing. So this man isn't even there anymore. This is the spirit of death. Aware of the sound of my own feet upon my path, the ancient is lost in a shadow world and gives no sign. So this is like really ominous start to the journey is that he's like, death is here, and I, w I nod to death like, oh, bye, good to see you, and there's no acknowledgement from death. So it's like we're leaving behind this world of death and despair and rancidness but look at how he paints that image. I think the importance here for structurally, there's a technical importance here for speech, which is structurally how do you make those those descriptions pop like that? Just going one after another I think is very cool. Here we have it again. Gray river road, gray sky. From rock to torrent rock flits a pied wagtail. That's so cool. What a great image, right? Wayfarers. A delicate woman bears a hamper of small silver fishes, and another bends low beneath a basket of rocks that puts my own light pack to shame. Her rocks will be hammered to gravel by other women of Pokhara and the labor of the myriad brown hands that will surface a new road south to India. So, as they're making their way out of the town, they're finding wayfarers, people working out there. Um, somebody's got a hamper of fish going back to the village. Somebody's got rocks. And he's like, huh, crazy. Through a shaft of sun moves a ba band of Megar women, scarlet shawled, they wear heavy brass ornaments in the left nostril. And fitfully, a little girl starts singing. The light radiates the white peaks of Annapurna marching down from the sky and the great rampart that spreads east and west for 1,800 miles, the Himalaya. The Alea abode of Hema snow. So he's giving us like word origins, how things are named, what things look like, who's who he's meeting. And it's important to him what race everybody is and 
where they come from. This is just his way of sorting the world. And the Himalayan mountains are there in the sun. So now that's their goal. That's where they're headed. And then he starts talking about these flowers and the different things that he spikes. He sees an Egyptian vulture and his close relatives in East Africa where G.S. and I first met. So here's the first of several moments I want you to pay attention to as he tells a story where he's describing this thing very scientifically. But then he makes a personal connection, which I think is super cool. And he's going to do this a lot as we go on, and it happens more and more and more and more as we go through the journey. So you want to pay a lot more attention to that as it goes. Like he'll say, these are the common birds, this is an East African bird. Oh, G and I first met there. And G GS says, huh, I wonder where this bird would, um, whether it would know what an ostrich egg is. And then he talks about how in Africa these birds throw rocks at the ostrich eggs and crack them open so they can eat them. Then he just randomly transitions. He's like, until recently, these Nepal lowlands were of broadleaf evergreen sal forest, the haunt of elephant and tiger. It almost se seems like we're watching a nature documentary in a lot of this. Or we could do it in that, who's that guy, David Attenborough? Until quite recently, these Nepal lowlands were broadleaf evergreen sal forest, the haunt of elephant and tiger and the great Indian rhinoceros. Forest cutting and poaching cleared them out. I don't think I'm doing a very good impression, but you see it seems to have that like, um, there's a power here in the neutrality of fact. You know, he's talking about how these animals are gone because of this um, activity. It's just like a modern nature documentary. He's sort of using that authoritarian voice, that authority voice. Um, and how all this stuff is happening. In Asia, more than all places on Earth, it is crucial to establish wildlife sanctuaries at once before the last animals are overwhelmed. And then he brings his friend GN, GS as a source. Man is modifying the world so fast and so drastically that most animals cannot adapt to the new conditions. And he just kind of leaves it at that. He's like, ah, we're seeing the last of the animals here. So this paragraph, you want to keep in mind this paragraph is an example of kind of how he's seeing things as we get later in the story. Uh, it's going to change quite a bit. It's going to change a little bit. So as we go through 28 here, um, he's kind of grasping. He's um, looking through, this is the September 28th entry. He's kind of grasping and trying to make sense of everything. Um, and everyone's taking a break. And we meet Tutkin, or Tukhtin, Tukhtin, sorry, Tukhtin, who acts like a porter. But why is he a porter? He seems like somebody who's a little bit too special. And he'll be a character that comes up from time to time. He's carrying their stuff. <coughs> and we go through this. And as he's looking here, as he's going through and relaxing, Figuring things out, trying to figure things out. He's kind of like, you know, the village is kind of dull. I'm ready to get going. And then he gets into this weird religious stuff where he starts talking about his understanding of Buddhism. I think this is interesting because he sees evidence for Buddhism everywhere. Uh, but then he's also doing this weird kind of classification of everybody as race and origin and root at the same time. He's talking about the Vedas. And what was different about Sakyamuni, the historical Buddha. He's actually trying to apply it. And that knowing, transcendent knowing, is in all beings, which is the unsentimental embrace of existence, which means I accept things as they come. I accept it. Um, I transform. I recognize transformation in the world. I recognize that things do not stay constant. And that sets me free from the fear of death and the fear of rebirth. Or the cycle of being coming around again until you realize it. 
So then he talks about how this stuff is very close to him and very true. And then he um, then he says this kind of like statement, which is a very weird way to stop after he's talking about his knowledge of Buddhism and how he thinks Buddhism came to be, which I think is a... Not something we're going to get into here, but maybe a little bit uncomplex or uncomplicated. This this land has a religious significance to him. And then there's a Buddhist temple that they're next to that has a plant descended from the Bodhi tree that Buddha was enlightened under, the Enlightenment tree, beneath which this man sat here in warm dawn ten days ago with three Tibetan monks in maroon robes. I watched the rising of the morning star and came away no wiser than before. So is that something that's praiseworthy? What's he saying there? But later I wondered if the Tibetans were aware that the Bodhi tree was murmuring with gusts of birds while another large pipe that was so close by that it touched the holy tree with many branches was without life. I make no claim for this event. I simply declare what I saw there at Bodh Gaya. Okay, so what he's saying is that they watched the morning star rise. They meditated but maybe they didn't mi- maybe they didn't get it but i heard it that their birds were murmuring and then there was another tree that was dead touching that one what does it mean i saw all this but i make no judgment this isn't my interpretation i'm just giving it to you as it is which is an interpretation he brought this up what's he trying to say here that there's some kind of wisdom that he has that they didn't get that tibetans were unaware of the of the deep deep deepness of what he could see because of his historical knowledge, because of his categorical knowledge. They are simple people, after all. He's talked about that. So I really wonder. Like, what's he trying to say here? I feel like this is a guy who's in a very uncomfortable situation, and he's used to kind of being the guy who knows. And he's in a very foreign place that's about to get even more foreign. And he's looking for familiarity. And one of the familiar things you could say is, oh, I know more than these people. I I know more than them. I, I can see things they can't see still. Still have a little bit more insight. Then he's talking about the village they're going to and all the people who've come there and the different tribes and races and who they worship. Um, and then, you know, some of the local stuff, how they like to harvest. They're going to harvest this stuff. And uh, what the children act like. And then he tries out his new tent. He's got a nice, like, one-person tent. He's sitting at the at the stools in the evening, kind of waiting to go to sleep. And uh, there are no road, r- roads west of Pokhara, which is the last outpost of the modern world. And one day's walk, we are a century away. So we're moving away from the modern world, even though at the same time we're getting these very modern world rhetorical framings of everything he's seeing. But there's a little bit of panic there. It's like, what did it mean? I saw this symbolism that would have been very important and the the Buddhist monks didn't see the symbolism of the tree. Did they get that? I I have no idea. I don't know. All I can do is tell you what happened. And then previously, he and GS are talking about the vulture and how, oh, we saw this vulture one of the first times we we, we met and became friends. So, you know, what's that about? We saw that that time too. So, He's trying to connect it to himself and trying to make sense of it. You can see that it's kind of working a bit, but maybe he's a little bit out of his, a little bit out of his uh, comfort zone. Okay, let's move ahead, and you can read all this stuff on your own. I don't want to talk about every single word in this first part of the book. There's so much interesting stuff happening. Um, let's go to October 4th and they've been um, stuck for a few days because of the rain and he's always trying to um, he's always trying to make things familiar and comfortable for himself
and he's shocked that the uh, the uh, porters are not that disciplined. Um, maybe a question you ask yourself as you read through those days is, um, what does he want to see, and what is he seeing, and how is he how does he deal with that? All right, this is the first mention of his family, October fourth, which is kind of surprising. He's talking about we've been eating rice and bread and we've had lentils and a few stray stuff, but now we have some fish, a little bit of buffalo, so the food's getting better, but we're not really ready to celebrate because we're kind of stuck here and we're not moving forward on the trip, and the trip is important because the trip is a means to an end. The trip is not to be enjoyed. It's a, it's a way to get somewhere. GS is off somewhere in his own head, right? He can't get to his research. He's a little bit frustrated that they've stayed there so long. And I'm wondering about my children. Ru, Sarah, and Luke are away at school and college, and the youngest is at home. Last summer, GS sent word from Pakistan that if Alex were of happy and adaptable turn of mind, he was and is, Kay Schaller, that's, the, that's uh, GS's wife, would be glad to take him into her household in Lahore, which is in Pakistan, where two uh, Schaller boys attend an American school. But since he's only eight, it seemed better to end in the end to forego this generous invitation, leave him in our own house, which had been lent to a family of his friends. And for the moment, at least, all is well. Just before leaving Kathmandu, which is the big uh, Nepalese um, capital, I received that that was where they all, where you fly into and uh, outfit yourself to go walking around in the wilderness up there. I received the following communication. It's a very cute letter from his youngest son. I think of the parting with my son Huh, look at that. I think of the parting with my son on the day that school had opened just a month before. Do you think that's a mistake? My son, my son. And it's been raining and cloudy and gray. So here we are kind of looking like we can't move forward where, you know, the past or his family, the things he's trying to get away from are catching up with him. Feelings he doesn't want to have, maybe. The school had opened just a month before a clear morning of September of monarch butterflies and goldenrod, late roses, shining pine needles, and flights of comorant headed south along the coast in a dry east wind. Alex asked how long I would be gone, and when I told him, blurted out, too long. I had driven him to school, and he was upset that he might be seen in tears. That's much too long, he wept, and this was true. Hugging him, I promised to be home before Thanksgiving. So this was a compromise. wonder when he said he was coming back, and he said too long. He doesn't tell us. Because maybe the narrator feels that uh, us reading how long he's going to be away from his young son is embarrassing to him, and he doesn't want us to really know how long he planned to be away. So that's the first mention of that, and we're just kind of left with that, and the next day is like, ah, the monsoon's end is now long overdue, but we're going to take off, and off we go. Off we go. And... um. How strange everything seems. How strange everything is. One eye feels like an observer of this man who lies here in the sleeping bag in the Asian mountains. Another eye is thinking about Alex. A third is the tired man who tries to sleep. So he's like, how strange everything seems. How strange everything is. He's splitting himself into three. There's three different tracks of thought. Then he goes back to Alex. In his first summer, he's forsaking all his toys. My son would stand wrapped. For near an hour in his sandbox in the orchard, doves and red wings came and went on the ward whim, the leaves dancing, the clouds flying, bird song, and the sweet smell of previet and rose. The child was not observing. He was at rest in the very center of the universe, a part of things unaware of endings and beginnings, still in unison with the primordial nature of creation, letting all light and phenomena pour through. Now, what's really weird here and interesting to me is this is normally the attribution that one would give to um, foreigners, particularly Buddhist uh, monks, Tibetans, as being this kind of, having this kind of pure connection to uh, the universe. Um, this is his son back home at the sandbox, and he's like attributing it to him. So he's like, wow, you know, there's there's my son who's um, the calm center of the universe. And then he connects it to ancient, the ancient, like, Agricurian hunter who became the deer he drew on the cave wall. There's no self to separate him from the bird or flower. So he's like his son doesn't have self-separation, which is a very romantic reading of his son, but it also shows how much he cares about and admires his son, even though it's like cringy, romantic. Oh, my son really gets it. He understands what life is all about. 
It's like this cringy stuff I hate that people say with like children can teach us so much. Oh, the purity of children can teach us so much. We just need to look at things like a child. It's just obnoxious. But this is a real flip of that in a way because he's like, he's there in the place. Just two days ago, he talked about being the place where there's a body tree descendant of where the Buddha was enlightened. And now he's thinking about his kid's sandbox as the site of watching an enlightened being commune with the universe. That's wild. And then we get this weird, he's starting to think about his son, and he says, amazingly, we take for granted that instinct for survival. Fear of death must separate from the happiness, pure in an uninterpreted experience in which body, mind, and nature are the same. In this debasement of our vision, the retreat from wonder, the backing away like lobsters from free-swimming life into safe crannies, the desperate instinct that our life passes unlived is reflected in proliferation without joy, corrosive money rot, the gross befalling of the earth and air and water from which we came. Huh. So, the instinct for survival must separate us from happiness. He uses it as lobsters going into crannies instead of enjoying the, I don't, I mean, that seems like nature to me. He thinks the lobsters are like not experiencing life. They're scared of nothing. They're just going into hiding. The desperate instinct that our life passes unlived. That's heavy. I know we've all kind of felt that from time to time, right? Corrosive money lot. Proliferation without joy. That's like buying stuff, I think, right? Just acquiring things. Corrosive money rot. The quest to make more money, no matter what. The gross befouling of the earth and air and water from which we came, like the pollution. Like he's trying to expand and make this argument that like the collection of things and the chase of money and all this is because we're scared of death and we can't accept a moment of, um, of pure joy or a moment of connection. Compare the wild, free paintings of the child with the stiff, pinched pictures these become as the painter notices the painting and tries to portray reality as others see it. Self-conscious now, he steps out of his own painting and finds himself apart from things, notices the silence all around, becomes alarmed by the vast significations of creation. The armor of the eye begins to form. This is very Freudian. The construction and desperate assertion of separate identity and loneliness. Man has closed himself up, but he sees all things through the narrow chinks of his cavern. So this is kind of a, um, a, a Buddhist argument I've read many times before, which is this idea that people get scared that um, their eye is fragile, that the ego is fragile. Your construction of yourself is very fragile, and you realize it's not clear to everyone who you are, and the fragility is um, kind of on the block. You can't really defend your yourself and your perception of yourself. So you start to create a little cocoon, a little defensive perimeter around yourself through language, through articulation of who you are, and you create an army of in, uh, an armor of interpretation and defense to protect you. I mean, it's super, um, it's super sad. It's super sad that we can't just paint how we want. We have to make it go with the reality and other people. I don't know if that's so sad. I kind of like art. Like I kind of like art. And I like art that tries to do a lot of different things. But he's just saying that like a lot of us just stop doing it because it's not reality. And then we realize that it's self-conscious because there's silence all around. Nothing is speaking to us anymore the way it did when we were a kid. I think that's what he's trying to say. Alex is eight and already has shut away the wildness of the world. I lost it too in early childhood, but memories would come on wings of light. Shining bird, high pines and sun, a fire and floating leaf, the autumn heat and weathered wood, wood smell, a child soft lichen on a stone, a light-filled eminence. This is very poetic. But do you see how, how the story is told here just through a bunch of nouns with commas? This is like speech. This would be a really great way to create an experience for audience, don't you think? Then we're, now we're in 1945. He talks about how he was on the watch. He wasn't ever relieved, and he became kind of connected to the waves, the wind. He lost his sense of self. His heartbeat was the heart of the world. He was a completely sleep-deprived, probably hallucinating a little, but at a complete connection, and then afterwards he was like, ah, I wish I could have understand understood what happened and why I feel like I missed that experience of connection. Then he starts talking about poetry, Thoreau, Hesse, Hemsen, um, 
Borga. Kierkegaard. So he's going to all the Western philosophy and stuff that um, he studied. And then he found hallucinogens. He found drugs in Peru. Peru. And then he was like, oh, okay, this stuff is going to help me see things another way. This would be in the 60s where a lot of people thought LSD and other drugs would help them, psilocybin would help them see the world in a different way. New perception, a freeing of the kind of um, impassable gate or impassable barrier between reality and the way we feel about our lives. Then he took heroin and became frightened by that. He became paralyzed. He thought he was going to die on the, f- on the floor. Then he was like, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then he went to go see a psychiatrist, a renegade psychiatrist, who was using hallucinogens with therapy and met a girl named Deborah Love who was look also looking for something, looking for that deep connection, looking for that way to transcend the ego and transcend the self so that you could access that kind of happiness, that childhood happiness of, of um, not really disconnection, but uh, shutting down all the barriers of the world. The search may begin with a restless feeling as if one were being watched. One turns in all directions and sees nothing, yet one senses that there's a source for this deep restlessness, and the path that leads there is not a path to a strange place, but the path home. So you're not really going anywhere. You're trying to find your home, and but you feel like you need to go out and look around and see the, you know, the restlessness keeps you going. But I'm just trying to find home. I'm trying to find the place where I'm loved and comfortable. The journey is hard for the secret place where we have always been is overgrown with thorns and thickets of ideas, of fears and defenses, prejudices and repressions. The Holy Grail is what Zen Buddhists call their own true nature. And each man is his own savior after all. And then there's this long, long, long quote from Carl Jung of all people. It's kind of like, ugh, this part was cool. And then you started quoting Jung and I was just like, but I mean, again, it's a product of the 70s. We have to give him, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt and say, look, He's doing the best he can with the resources he has. He's trying to communicate the best he can for the audience at the time. He could not predict our state of being and our way of thinking. He's trying his best. So let's look at this part here because I think this is very insightful for the way the book unfolds because this is exactly what the book is going to do. We'll begin the search with a restless feeling as if one were being watched. That's why he's so worried about the eyes of death and all the people in the village looking at him. One turns in all directions and sees nothing. All he sees are ideas, the thicket. Where does he say that? Overgrown with thorns and thickets of ideas. He's trying to look at the landscape and the trees, but all he can do is tell us their scientific names. What stock these people come from. These animals are also seen in Africa. Um, it's weird. He's like talking about these people as if they're like objects for analysis. So the thicket is all around him and the thorns are all around him. And he's, he's trying to pierce his way through that. And he's looking for home, just like he is when he meets Deborah Love and trying to find, use hallucinogens to find a comfortable place where he can feel comfortable at home and comfortable with himself and, you know, happy that he can feel that, um, that sense of like, um, I'm not haunted by the fragility of my ego anymore. I'm part of something larger, which a lot of people spend their whole lives questing for. I think, I'm, I mean, all of us really like that feeling. So he's trying to figure out his way home. And I think this is the I think this paragraph is exactly the book that we're going to get here on page 40, 44, 45. This is what we're going to get uh, as we move through it. Is This is the story. And then he talks about Jung and Taoism. And he says, you know, reading Jung was the first clue to my nature of distemper. I was sitting in the garden in the mountains of Italy when I read it. I was so excited I jumped up out of my chair and yelled. The searching is not morbid. So he thought he was seeking like death. He thought he was seeking the end of himself. But reading Jung make, made him thought, I'm seeking a deeper connection, a deeper way of understanding life. Not that D and I, he's talking about Deborah Love, his hallucinogenic partner he met. We're not seekers. We're embarrassed by such terms and shied from people who employ them. You can see them being like, trying to be super cool, like, ah, I'm not one of them. I'm doing it for real reasons. You know, you get this kind of snootiness from the, from the narrator, like, we were doing it for real reasons. Instant gurus were turning up as thick as bean sprouts, but true teachers were very hard to find. So then they took mescaline together. 
and had a bad experience. And then as they took more together, then they realized that they shared a mind and they started to have a romantic experience. And that turned them towards Zen. So they, they liked doing LSD, then they kind of took on the, the you know, like going to a magic show. It's like, oh, this is cool. But it really didn't, um, you know, it became kind of a Vegas show in a way is I think what they're saying. And then they found Zen and that helped. But now these psychedelic years seem far away. I neither miss them nor regret them. They're an important part of the journey, right? Drugs can clear away the past, enhance the present, toward the inner garden. They can only point the way, so they're just a sign. Lacking the temper of ascetic, ascetic discipline, the drug vision remains a sort of dream that cannot be brought over into daily life. So there's another way to think about this with the asceticism, which is um, withdrawing all pleasure from the body and just having a very serious, minimal life, like no spicy food, drink water only, this kind of asceticism. You can think about like Henry Thoreau at Walden, or you can think about um, John, John Crevacured, St. John of the Cross and his asceticism, which is quite extreme asceticism. But um, this kind of idea of denying yourself certain pleasures so that you can focus on what's true and good uh, is another way of kind of altering one's perception to get a connection to what's deeper about life and what really matters. Um, old mist may be banished, that is true, but the alien chemical agent forms another mist, maintaining the separation of the eye from the true experience of the one. So the drugs might make you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself, but really it just reinforces that. That ego reinforces that ego. So I'm moving pretty quickly through some of this stuff. I think there's a lot more to say about a lot of the, um, a lot of the book. I'm looking at my marked up copy here just to kind of see some of the other things. So as he talks in it, the important thing to look for is how he brings in these Western assumptions and conceptions uh, and how he brings in the quotes of um, people like um, Tukten and G.S., who are important characters, but very different. I think one of the ways of thinking about Tukten, who's one of the porters, is that he's kind of a, um, a voice like a little shouldered devil. Do you know this trope of like people have the devil and the angel on the shoulders and they'll tell them kind of how to think? So you can think of Tutkin on one shoulder and GS on the other shoulder as commentators about like how this guy should feel, how the narrator should feel about what's going on. And he brings both of their views into these things. And sometimes they're in agreement, sometimes they're not. But it's not clear who the devil is or who the angel is. They're just both influential voices on his shoulders. Which I think is um, an interesting way to think about it. That's how I think about them as well. Um, and then they have this crazy experience where he cuts a walking stick and then they go into a camp and some of these mastiffs attack them and they have to fight them off. And, um, the locals use these to protect from wolves and other wild animals. They have these very well-trained mastiffs and the mastiffs are very aggressive dogs. Um, and it's like, ooh. And then they have to sleep with their stuff because they're afraid it'll be stolen, but then at the same time, people are praying in the Tibetan Buddhist way of saying, Aum, Aum, and uh, trying to get that that vibration prayer going to, to find unification and all in this, like, syllable that's supposed to have all existence vibrate at the same frequency. But they're still sleeping with their stuff because they're, yeah, they don't want it stolen. So, the porters left. It's been a few days, like we learned in the beginning, but they're still mad about it, and then they have to find some other porters to um, help them. And he kind of has this bathing scene where he cleans his clothes, and then he cuts his long hair down to the skull, which is like kind of becoming a monk. And then he um, cuts off his wristband. He removes his watch. Uh, he's sort of taking off, you know, he's bathing, but he's also kind of taking off all this effication of the West. These things that were important guides to him before are being cut off. He's sort of bathing symbolically here. Um, so the, these old symbols, the watch and the wristband and, and his hair, 
these old symbols of who he is and how he navigates the world and how he understands the world are removed. They're no longer useful. And then he's doing more of his history stuff again. Here's how the geography went. Here's all this is. Yeah, this reminds me of Native American stuff. Then he kind of makes these weird primitivist claims about how Native American peoples, Muslim peoples, Hasidic peoples all have the same idea of God as this um, profound kind of energy of the universe. It's very hippie. And I'm not sure I feel about it, but this is him trying to make that connection. That connection is something bigger than the ego, and he's doing it in these kind of like epic terms. And then they get someone who says, the the roads are slippery, it's pretty bad. Um, you, we got to like leave uh, Dorpatan, which is the town they're in now, uh, before too long, because it's, then it's going to be kind of icy. And then we get some more of this um, personal stuff that comes in, which is haunting him. We got to leave the city because you're going to think about your past too much if you're not moving, dude. And he doesn't want to think about these things, it seems to me. He heard a Tibetan boy singing and he had a dream about Alex, his eight-year-old boy, whose mother died of cancer just last year. Okay, so now we're, we're getting a more of a sense of what's motivating this guy to go, go, go. And this might be the avoidance of grief, the avoidance of acceptance of the death from cancer. It could be a number of things. He has this weird dream where the little fox was his um, son who wasn't receiving care. I mean, it's because you left him there, dude, and you went on this trip with your friend. Like right after his mom died, a year ago. It now seems certain that my promise to be home by Thanksgiving will be broken. So they plan to be there October 15th. They're not going to make it there. They won't be back till December because they got to walk all the way back around the way they're going to make it back. So he knows that he's going to break the promise to his son and he can't communicate with him. And GS has the same problem. Um, you know, but then he, he also discounts the reports. He's like, well, if you took them seriously, you'd never leave home. They kind of exaggerate how bad things are out there. We can make it. We can make it. I've been here before. So he's got to make it in time because his research will be for nothing if he gets up there and it's already snowed because the sheep won't be doing what he wants to study. And he devours books like chocolate, almost like books are like a candy to him, like a sweet. And then he also writes poetry. So here's a poem he thinks is better than his poem that GS has written, which I think is funny. All right, well, that, that's probably enough for this time. I've already talked for a very long time in this video, but I'm very curious um, what you guys think of this. Now, you don't have to speak about the book, but there might be things in there that you think are kind of interesting that you might want to talk about yourself as we get more into it. I'll probably do two or three videos in this book. It's not a long book. It's only about 300 pages in the paperback version I have. This version, I don't know if you have this one. But uh, it's not a long book, and it's an easy read, and you'll get through it pretty quickly. But what I want you to think about is um, how travel can be this kind of long metaphor for something else that you want to talk about. I think that's what he's doing. He's trying to come to terms with this horrible death and how to be a dad to his youngest kid who's lost his mother. His other kids seem inconsequential. They're, like, older. They Maybe they're dealing with it better. We don't know. But notice as he stays stuck in a town more, he thinks more and more about his son and He's worried about him, but he doesn't want to be because it's kind of uncool. we got to worry about our connection to the universe and all these Buddhist things and the coolness of spirituality and being connected to everything. And, oh, it's hard. but no, no. So it's kind of this very Western kind of sense. As, he, as we get further into it, these are, this is going to be disrupted more and more. So keep an eye out for that. I think it makes it pretty interesting. Well, this book is um, a little bit different than dialogue and different than American dialogue for sure. But um, are there connections here? Maybe you want to do a connection between this and dialogue. Maybe that's something worth talking about. Maybe there's a connection here between this and the um, Joseph Ellis. As I talked about in the Joseph Ellis video, um, he wants us to be more careful and complex and uh, not so certain about things. That's the advantage of the historian's rhetoric over the attorney. That's what he talks about in that book. So think about these things. They're all kind of connected. Uh, let me know if you have questions. 
Thanks for watching the video and more to come about Snow Leopard. Oh, yeah.